and greetings. Welcome. And I see nobody's here except me. And I'm already almost 20 minutes late. Well, not really. I say that I start around 7.30 and I usually start around quarter till. And that just seems to be the way it goes. But I figured that way it gives people time to get here. And of course, they're later than I am. Or they're just going to catch it later, even. Because what really matters is be told. Not whether or not anybody watches or cares. Because in the end, it's going to matter. And whether people cared or not is going to matter. How about that for an introduction? And of course, it's only the introduction to the introduction because I've got to keep adding to this introduction. We have preliminaries to deal with at some point. And I have the, uh, let's call it the information regarding the different areas that we're going to get into tonight. And so let's look at the board to begin with. It says, tonight, the extension continues with fall of man. Oh, and that tells me the colonel is sending a message out. And I better, uh, you can see it's fresh. And so I'm, I turned off the ringer so we don't get distracted too much. And... Um, yeah, this uh, latest point from the colonel having to do, oh, wow. Biden appointed judge rules religious parents can't opt kids out of pro-LGBT school lessons. See, this is happening right now. And, um, and there is the deal. And there's a bit more here, including a federalist.com link and so I think we're going to be seeing and hearing a lot more about all of this <coughs> pro-LGBT lessons Muslim, Catholic, Orthodox parents argue the school board's no policy violates their constitutional rights well uh same old, same old is what I have to say about it. I think that everything is just going along as scheduled and planned, except tonight you're going to see what goes on back in the garden. Okay. I had an interesting visit on this uh, Labor Day, a day that is no different than other days which is why we're here tonight on Monday night. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's Labor Day, I'm laboring, how about you? Uh, I had a visitation, two bucks, and that's not as in two dollars. And I'm telling you, these were some big guys, apparently maybe brothers, and all that if it's eight points or ten points it's got to be eight because there's eight of them kind of sticking up like that you know and it was very awesome to see so I'm going to show it to you momentarily after we get through the preliminaries and welcome whoever just came on I guess uh, we are about ready to get started I have to do the preliminaries though and uh, here's the deal okay uh, on Every one of these broadcasts, I bring up this board. If you're kind of new here, expect not to understand some of this. Please stick with it. Previous weeks will help. And tonight is no exception. It's going to get fairly busy. In fact, tonight we won't be able to finish. It didn't matter how much I prepared or how late. I mean, unless I cut things out. Here, I'd like to show, darken the screen a little bit. The second of my preliminary comments is that grace and the gospel are good news, but religion is not good news, so we're not a religious broadcast. True or pure Christianity is not a religion, and if you think Christianity is a religion, then hear me out. <coughs> so excuse me, uh, I 
beg to differ with you when it comes to what we call, even uh, if I want to get technical, infralapsarian orthodox Christianity. Now, I always bring up this board third, and I let everybody know that this is a technical board. It looks like child's play. But the truth be told, or the truth be known, or both, um, this is a very uh, large-scale exposition of God's plan. And it involves pre-history, history, and even post-history, meaning uh, eternity. So beyond human history, because the promise was made in history that God said he would deliver man from his sin, from a penalty of death that man could not in any way, shape, or form provide the uh, balance and make the payment. So God said, I will send a Messiah. That's the little M there, which is also the Hebrew word Mashiach became a Latin and Greek. First word, Christos. Both of them came from different languages, different geography, different periods. But eventually, up till this day, Christos means anointed one. Mashiach means anointed one. And when we believe in Christ, represented by the cross of Christ, and when we look to the cross and say, okay, I hear that what was done on that cross was the payment for the sins of the world. And it's true. So when you understand that God made a promise to send an anointed one who would be born without sin and live a sinless life and go to the cross and be the sin bearer. You had to be perfect to be able to pay the penalty of death. Because we're all going to die. To rely on their behalf as a substitute so that they can live. And if he had not been perfect, his death would not have counted as anything special to God, but it did because he never sinned. So the fact that the perfect lamb of God, sinless, uh, uh, how do they say, um, unblemished, went to the cross and died for our sins, yours, mine, everybody's past, present, and future. Well, um, that is, made it possible for you and me to believe in Christ. That's the story. And that's why at Christmas time, everybody gives gifts. The gifts are symbolic of a gift from God, which was to give his uniquely born son, monogenes huios in Greek. That means that born with Adam's original sin. And we're going to see that tonight based on, in particular, a paper that I did uh, in September of 1994. So, almost 30 years ago. At least, uh, now that it's September of 23, that would be tw exactly 29 years. In fact, it says 28 September, so in a couple of weeks. Uh, about three and a half weeks. And so 30 years ago when I wrote that paper, I talked about this business in that paper. It was a class project. We'll get into that a little later. So um, this guy, the Lord Jesus Christ, went to the cross and paid the penalty Adam's original sin, all other sin. We could get rid of this thing called an old sin nature. So when you believe in Christ, you are indwelt by God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, you are placed into union with Christ forever. Can't lose your salvation. 
you're also put in this bottom circle. Now, this you can't get out of the top circle, but the bottom one is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, all you have to do to get out of that one is commit a personal sin. And by sinning, you end up being controlled once again by your old sin nature, which started when you were born. And the reason it stops is at salvation. Okay, why? Your old sin nature, it continues in your body, but it doesn't control you anymore because through Christ... You have victory on the cross. You are in union with Christ. You share in everything that he possesses, which includes all the aspects of deity, not that we become little deities, it's a misnomer. Um, but what is, we possess God's righteousness. We call it plus R, absolute righteousness. And when you are therefore in union with Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the spiritual acumen to understand what we're going to study tonight. Um, so if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it would behoove you to, during our next moment here of silent prayer, for you to tell God that you are believing in Jesus Christ. And at that moment, it is the moment of salvation for you. You are placed in everything I just said, the top circle, the bottom circle, indwelt by God, and ready to understand spiritual, exegetical, biblical, theological, and sometimes even supernatural stuff. So, on that note, we're going to now take a moment and prepare ourselves so that we can study the extension of the angelic conflict and by R.B. Theme Jr. there at the bottom. And we will start the fall of man. We will not finish that section tonight because it's too long. But we will see more about the angelic conflict by R.B. Theme Jr., that text. And I have many other things. That's why I say it's going to take a while to get through this next section. So on that note, without further adieu, let us have a moment of silent prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for the wonderful time. It's a Monday night. And on Monday nights, most of the nights, most of the Monday nights, we get together at about this time and pull out another piece of Bible doctrine to study. And tonight, it's going to be fantastic because we are at the beginning of the fall of man where we see the need for a Savior and the need for salvation and the fact that you have provided in every way every way, shape, and form, everything we need for life and godliness, even in this fallen world. So thank you for the things we're about to study and the things we're about to observe and check out. Thank you for the blessings of spiritual acumen that we can understand things that are above and not anything like that. And sometimes that's where we go in these strange things. You have to get uh, one step past rationalism and in uh, the other, the two of the three means of perception, rationalism and empiricism. And we have to get to that third one called faith. And so I pray that anyone who has not known the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior by faith alone in Christ alone, simple believing in Christ and you are saved. Now is that moment for the privilege of making that claim and telling God that you're believing in Jesus Christ for your salvation as he is your personal Lord and Savior, even though you don't know for sure the deal, because when you're at the beginning, you don't know. You just start out with faith. So thank you for all these things. And we ask them as always, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name. Okay, so we are now ready and able to continue. Um, instead of just, sometimes I carry on 
from the page where we left off, which in this case tonight, as it says up here, is going to be whoops, page 27. And that's where we're going to continue reading from. But we also are going to look at several other things. And when we get to page, I think it's 29. Let me double check here. Actually, it's page 28. In the introduction of the fall of man, that's where we're going to take a look at an exegetical I did. And I'll tell you more about that when we get there. Also, um, tonight, I want to mention things that are going on. And I know probably not too many people are going to see this, but th those of you who do will. Um, for obvious reasons, I am quite certain that this broadcast is severely throttled, censored, and uh, what's another word? Suppressed. <laughs> Use a different word. Um, I wanted to mention that it's very interesting. The things that are going on lately in our in our world today, and particularly in our country, we have a lot of things going on that unfortunately are causing us to be very much in the dark when it comes to what should be in the light of day and clear. And unfortunately, the powers that be do things and they make, they make things look different. You know that expression, uh, they make things appear and seem different than they appear. Um, we may think that things are going one way and then all of a sudden we find out something else. And I wanted to make a few uh, videos and at least play them for you. But I realized that, uh, well, it, you may be able to find those on your own anyhow. So... As I mentioned, I wanted to play for you some nice videos, some uplifting things. And I mentioned uh, earlier about uh, taking us back to the garden. So uh, you'll like these videos because they are much nicer. Uh, by the way, the Arizona skies can be uh, quite interesting. Here's a picture that one of my old classmates took, and it is in Arizona. And you can see it looks pretty interesting, the, the sky and the clouds and the sun reflecting and that what looks like, uh, I guess it's rain coming down and there's this ray uh, a, a reddish ray, and that is part of rainbow. But the skies are pretty close. And this picture was taken by uh, my friend, he should get credit for it, Dr. Larry Gassner, who lives in the Scottsdale area. But uh, what I'm going to show you now are some interesting pictures and video that I took. Now, this will be funny. You'll see some of that house routine. And let me make sure the volume is up. Let me see how high I can get it. All right, here we go. Um, I noticed a couple of bucks today in the backyard. And so here they come. Backyard. There he is. Oh, wow. He's got... Some... I had to run over to the other part of the house. Go look in the kitchen window. But I, I thought there was only one. Uh, I can't get a good shot of him. Yeah, not there I can't. <laughs> I think he's an eight-point buck. And I'm going to get... I'm going to try to get another angle on him. Yeah, beautiful. Look at that. 
probably 150 to 200 pounds. Yeah, there you can see uh, the points, but you're going to see a lot better pictures okay, here. Let's try again from here. We're trying again, only this time I'm going to the slider again. And I don't know how I can make all this noise, but here we go. I guess because of the locusts. Now you see both of them a little better. And they are big. Probably 150, 200 pounds each. And those are deer, not elk. Full grown puppies. So that's, I got a whole bunch of this to show you. They're lucky I didn't have my 30-06 and hungry. That's what the Remington 742 is made for. Most definitely. It's not even fair they're so close. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair shooting. Yeah, it's backyard stuff, right? Look at that. My iPhone wouldn't allow me to zoom more than that, so I that's as close as I could get in on it. But I was very much blown away by how close they were and how beautiful they are. Okay. Ah, I'm telling you, it gets better. Okay, there's that guy. And then there's this one. Munch, munch. They're having a good time. Munch, munch. Don't mind me. I'm just taking pictures. Those guys are huge. They don't look that big there, but they're big. Healthy. And those are the locusts you hear in the background. Oh, yeah, they're just munching away, having a good old time. That was so neat to be able to see those big old antlers. They would have done just fine on Santa's sleigh. Trying to see. How about that for close? Munch, munch, munch. Isn't that peaceful? All right, here's some more. I got about five more of these at least. But check, check out the scenery. Not quite a petting zoo. They'll run away from you. I thought it was fun just to see him carrying You'll see some more good stuff coming up here. Ah, yeah, this gets good. 
You can almost see the uh, fuzz on the antlers and the hair on his nose. That's the end of that one. That was a good one. And then here I got some more. This is from a different room. Decided, all right, I'm gonna zoom in some more. I like the French expression, comme si de rien n'était, as if nothing, you know. They were grazing for about at least an hour, I think. 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half, I don't know. But that is very close, as you can see. In the Prescott National Forest. And his friend is still over here. Munching in the sun. Yep, there, there, is. there he is. There's something well hidden. Kind of hard to see. And now here you only see his <laughs> All right, what about this one? I don't remember what this is. Oh yeah, there he is. Oh, and I was outside, so I think he saw me and I didn't move and then he didn't move. And after a while I cut the video because I figured I'd just take a short one. And then I'll take another one. Because if he's not going to move, he could sit there like that for a long time, right? All right, so here he still is, sitting there doing nothing. And once in a while, their tail wags. That was a short one because of that. And there, now he was scratching himself. Tail wagging. So I'm in the yard, and I was wondering, uh-oh, are they going to see me? There's a shot. These are some pics uh, afterwards from the videos. Um, that one's not very good. Oh, it may be because I wanted to show the other one in the background. Uh, yeah, there he is. Oh, that's his butt. That's funny. Let's see here. Oh no, there's the front end. He's just uh, neck down. You can kind of see him there. And let's see. This is these antlers. Pretty amazing. Right there on the patio. Look at that. Uh, that's kind of hard to see, but you can definitely see the shape of the antlers. But these are big old antlers. So, um, that was a visitation from nature. I like that. While I'm uh, doing my exegesis and checking out everything that we're going to be looking at tonight. So, that was part of the day. And part of the preparation. Um, let's see. What have I got here in my notes? So we're going to be looking at the fall of man through my Romans 5 exegetical as it is mentioned in our text. I should mention anybody who is interested in getting this text because it'll be a while before we get through it. Um, it's RB theme Jr. The Angelic Conflict. And you can get it simply by going to 
uh, at the bottom there, www.rbtheme, that's T-H-I-E-M-E dot org, or calling them 713-621-3740, or snail mail, writing to them. And everything is available either on MP3, CD, DVDs, etc., etc., without charge or obligation. So, uh, and you want to ask also for the Doctrinal Bible Studies Catalog and whatever else they want to give you uh, that first day that you get connected to RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. So, um, the other thing, the, the details we're going to get into tonight, and I, I did it this way, I thought we should look from the table of contents we had the preface and introduction. We had chapter one, do angels really exist in the angelic creation? What's going on there? And chapter two, the opening of the conflict, Lucifer, the angel of light, the prehistoric conflict, Satan's prehistoric fall, Satan's attitude, there's five I wills, and then the angelic revolt and the trial of Satan, which then brings us to, and this is where we are now, Chapter 3, The Extension of the Conflict. So, Satan appeals his sentence and the role of humanity in Satan's appeal and human volition is the issue. So, um, we, and we have looked at human volition is tested. So the divine design, and we can see the roles of the man and the woman, and that's much different than what you'll hear today in the press and the media and the TV news and whatever. But in the divine design, you have this issue with the focus on the tree. That is the tree of life, the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. And uh, it says there's the attack on the woman. We saw that last week and the woman's response. And tonight we start, as it says here on this side, page 26, 27, the fall of man. And then we look at the sin of the woman, the sin of the man. And now you got to laugh. Passing the bucks. We had the bucks today. Do you see how that ties in with uh, with our our text? I said, okay, well, if we're going to have a section called passing the buck, and let me show it to you. I said, I think I'll show you the two bucks that passed by. Do you think I could make that happen? Or is that divine humor? <laughs> I mean, come on. That just happened today. I get two bucks in the backyard. And right here, it says, Passing the Buck, which is on page 33 in the extension of the conflict. But as you will see when we get there, it has nothing to do with two bucks that passed in the backyard. And I thought you might get a kick out of the fact that this indeed happened this way. So we're not quite to page 33 yet. We're actually at page 27, the bottom of page 27, the fall of man. So let's start there. Uh, we ended last time with the woman's response, and this has to do in uh, Genesis 3, verses 2 and 3 where the woman was having her conversation with uh, the serpent. And in Genesis 3, 5, the serpent says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, today we took a trip into the garden. Back to the press force in Amahai County, the uh, Navajo Indians. And you got to see, courtesy of my phone, two bucks. 
So uh, there you go, two bucks worth. Let's start at the bottom of page 27. The fall of man. In the wake of Satan's temptation of the woman, uh, and it says in the wake of Satan's temptation of the woman would occur an event with repercussions for the remainder of human history. Adam would commit the first act of willful cognitive disobedience toward God. By the way, notice that today in my garden, it was almost like pre-sin, you know, <laughs> where ah, you just have a couple of bucks uh, chewing on the the garden. They weren't eating, and thus uh, they both got out with their lives. Adam's original sin would result in the total depravity of his progeny, the fall of mankind. Romans 5, 12 through 14. See that right there? All right, this, before we get to the sin of the woman, we're looking at Romans 5, 12 through 14. You know what? Um, well, all right, I'll do it in this order. I'll just go ahead and pull out. Last week, I showed you that I have this folder. It's pretty thick. Compare it to the thickness. Here's my, my Bible, Bible. Oh, I guess we want to see that side. If you look at how thick the Bible is and you look at how thick this is, this is only one class. This, as it says here, is NT205. That's uh, New Testament 205, Dallas Theological Seminary, fall of 94. And my subject tonight, and of course, and from our text, Oh, I got it backwards, so I got to go this way. There we go. Is, well, I want to show you first, there's a serious syllabus. I like the alliteration with the S's. Here is the semester 1994, exegesis of Romans, New Testament 205, Dr. Harold Honer. Now, David Lowry, Dr. Lowry, I didn't see him or know him or have him. But here you see the scope of the course, objectives, textbooks, requirements, basis of grading, bibliography, and schedule. And this is a pretty serious, it says special emphasis will be given to the theological themes and overall argument of the epistle. And notice this course is an exegetical theological study of Paul's epistle to the Romans in the Greek text involves treatment of selected historical, grammatical, structural, and lexical data which elucidate the meaning of this important New Testament document. All right, so believe me. This I cover almost no one else. Absolutely amazing the amount of stuff that this guy would offer for us to know about this particular, uh, oh yeah, there's, there I am. Look at this, September 29th. I get to do Romans 5, 12 through 21. Okay, and this other guy, Chen, also did it. Do Wednesday at noon. Notice, tells you when you got to turn it in. All right, so guess what? That paper is right here. And I originally gave me a B minus and then he made it a B. And here you can see all the things figured out and discussed. And I was a newbie, but let me tell you something. Dr. Honer 
We used to call him Dr. Hitler because he was quite uh, difficult. And here you can see my cover page, um, my DTS box, Adam and Christ comparison, contrast, and justification and righteousness versus condemnation and sin. Those verses, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Now in tonight's text, we are looking at 5, 12 through 14. And what I wanted you to see here with a translation that does not look like the translation in your Bible. But it says here, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death, and in this way to all men death came because all sinned. 13. For until the law, sin was already in the world, and sin not being charged to each one's account, being that there is no law. This is Paul speaking, right? And I'm translating it from Greek. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who were not sinning in the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So every other category that they could do if they weren't doing the one that Adam did. Because... Well, his was yeah, fruit, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it says, so we're not sinning in the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Now, in the sense of being the pattern of the one to come, uh, that would be that the Lord Jesus Christ would come and would not do that bad thing which is the, uh, let's call it the sin period, committing a sin. And therefore, he would be, as I mentioned early on tonight, the sin bearer, because since he who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf, meaning uh, all the sins imputed on him, sin, and then would die, Therefore, we didn't have to die. So that's a little bit what this Romans 5, 12 through 14 is covering. Now, that's only the beginning of my paper because it doesn't do any of the explaining. And uh, I would say it this way, the security of righteousness is based on God's free gift. And Paul draws, conclu con bleh, draws conclusions tying the previous subsection, which would be verses 1 to 11 of Romans 5, regarding condemnation and justification. So in verse 12, sin and death entered the world through one man. You have A, one man sinned, thus sin entered the world. That would be verse 12a. 12b, death came through sin. of C because all sinned and it keeps going from there now here I'll just show you how there are point one, point two, point three, and eventually point four and this deals with like getting to verses 18 and 19 point five going right through verses 20 and 21 and then you get into exposition the commentary and it goes on and on from there. So, as I, I'll mention this first part because we're looking at verses 12 through 14. Security is based on God's free gift. Paul concluded his consideration of justification by faith with an analogy demonstrating that while all men are in fact sinners in Adam, all are potential beneficiaries of Christ's death and justification. The links are... between Adam and Christ is in Christ or that the security in Christ is even more secure than damnation in Adam. 
we see that even before the law, people died because of Adam's sin. Adam infected humanity with death. In a greater way, Christ restored humanity with life. The human race is directly related to Adam and his sin, but through the work of God, a free gift of grace if we receive it, the human race can be related to Christ, resulting in justification. The theology of this verse is based on the concept of corporate solidarity of the human race, i.e. federal headship. And I cite uh, a, another verse, Hebrews 7, actually two verses, 9 and 10. With or without the law, people sin and die. Romans 5, 12, including Romans 3, 23, that, you know, uh, uh, all die. I mean, the, the penalty of sin is death. Uh, Adam's disobedience caused humanity to be made sinners. So humanity is made sinners. Romans 5, 19. And also you could cross-reference that with 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Sin could not be charged as a violation of a specific command where there was no law, but sin existed nevertheless before the law was given at Sinai, so by Moses, as was evidenced by universal death from Adam to Moses. So Paul used Adam as the pattern in Romans 5.14, which again is a part of our text here where it says um, Romans 5.12 through 14. Now, I'm going to stop reading from my exegetical pink page, which is the cover, says exegetical exposition paper critique. And, you know, uh, Romans 5, 12 through 21. And uh, I did end up with a B on that paper, which was remarkable to me. Because Dr. Hitler, as we call him, Dr. Honer, affectionately, uh, was, if not the hardest, we called him Dr. Hitler. We had another guy, um, Dr. Uh, Chisholm, Bob Chisholm. We used to call him, he didn't have a doctor title, but we called him the general. So he wasn't Dr. General, but he was the general. He was really tough. And Dr. Honer was really tough. They were the two toughest guys. And um, I did do well much of the time. Enough. I don't remember what my final grade is. I, do I have it here? I have the paper with my final grade on it. I don't know where it is if I do have it. So I don't remember what my final grade was. But I know I did well because I was very content. <laughs> I was happy enough uh, to, to do okay. And I mean, I was blown away, actually. I think I even got either an A- minus or something almost unbelievable, considering it was Dr. Honer. Um, and like I said, since I don't see it, can't find it, I'm not going to bother because you don't care anyway. Uh, and at this point... It doesn't matter anymore. I'm just glad I did okay. I guess I'll put that folder back here and it'll go back in my file cabinet. Pick up through, uh, starting at page 27 at the bottom, the fall of man introduction. So let's look again. As I mentioned here, we see Romans 5, 12 through 14. Let's look at Genesis 3, 6a. The sin of the woman. Excuse me, I'm going to have a sip of my uh, Pellegrino and lime. Cheers. So we're doing okay so far on my itinerary here. Romans, I'm sorry, Genesis 3, verse 6a, just the first part. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and no, it's pari in Hebrew. Following her discussion of the tree with Satan, the woman began to rationalize disobedience. 
She had swallowed Satan's lie instead of metabolizing God's truth. Uh, she persuaded herself that she needed what she thought that fruit could provide. Wisdom. She looked longingly at the fruit, the object of the test. God's mandate was blotted out of her thinking. Her vulnerability to the temptation made her ripe for overt disobedience even before she plucked and tasted the fruit. Man has perpetuated this mentality throughout history. People who have been provided everything by God's immeasurable grace continually desire more. Hmm. The pain of man is satisfied. And who prods us in this quest? Satan. The more the woman stared at the tree in the middle of the garden, the more the fruit was a delight to the eyes. Aspirations of being like God lingered in her mind. To her, the tree was desirable to make her as wise as God, the final rationalization. Being tempted was not wrong, but succumbing to temptation was her downfall. At this point, the first overt sin in the human race occurred. She ate the forbidden fruit. The penalty for her disobedience was immediately imposed. She died spiritually. Notice that special word there, spiritually. She died spiritually and lost her relationship with God. Satan in his genius had plotted to separate the woman from the authority umbrella of the Lord and her. He exploited her role as responder. In turn, she reversed her role toward Adam and became the initiator. She enticed her husband to ignore God's word just as she had done. So there's a role reversal there. And that's part of the problem. And that's the beginning of the problem. And we still have that with us ever since. It's amazing and horrible. <laughs> um, okay, so now on page 28, we look at the sin of the man, right? So, Adam was faced with a dilemma. Either maintain his obedience to God or follow the lead of his now spiritually dead wife. He could choose fellowship with God in the garden or fellowship with the woman outside the garden. Same choice many men would make today. So that's a love story. We don't have time to get into it, but I would get into that if we did. So Genesis 3, 6b, <coughs> continuing. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Hmm. Adam, the ruler of the earth and head of the first household, abdicated his authority. He responded to his wife's overture, even though he knew better. He had no illusions concerning the meaning of God's prohibition, which he now flagrantly disregarded. The woman, in reaction to Adam's authority, had responded to the deceit of Satan. Adam knowingly abandoned his authority, misused his freedom, and decided to follow the woman. See, this is where Mary... has to draw a line and a man has to know to draw them. It's really rough, which includes up, uh, up to and until uh, divorce. But in this case, he would have divorced his wife. How about that? If you think about it, pretty weird. He responded. Notice he, he didn't initiate. He responded to his wife's overture, even though he knew better. He had no illusions concerning the meaning of God's prohibition, which he now flagrantly disregarded. The woman in reaction to Adam's authority had responded to the deceit of Satan. Adam knowingly abandoned his authority, misused his freedom, and decided to follow the woman. He too became subservient to Satan and rejected the divine mandate. Adam only did as it says, and he ate. Satan's ploy had worked. Now in spiritual death, 
Adam and the woman were separated and estranged from God. They were condemned. Without hope, without everlasting life. Aha! The same arrogance and negative volition found in Satan propelled the first humans into a parallel fall with equally disastrous consequences for the entire human race. In other words, including me and thee. Adam fell under the condemnation of sin and, uh, let's see, uh, like Satan, became an outcast. Because Adam was condemned, the entire human race was also condemned, 1 Corinthians 15.22a. Um, you can go back to Romans 5, uh, verses 12 to 21, but particularly where we were in verses 12 through 14 uh, in my exegetical. Satan's contention that a loving God cannot sentence his creatures who have chosen against him to eternal condemnation was proved wrong in the garden. All right, so now we get to Operation Fig Leaves. has a military uh, twist there, Operation something or other, Operation Desert Storm, Operation Fig Leaves. Same area of the world, by the way, Mesopotamia, uh, where the Euphrates and Tigris meet at the cradle of civilization. That's very probably the area where the Garden of Eden was and thus the cradle civilization. Life had been created without the knowledge of sin. Before the fall, they were ignorant of evil. Each possessed a human spirit for the fellowship with God, and neither had a sin nature. Now here we have a footnote. What is the sin nature? And I mentioned it on our chart there, the OSN and AOS, Adam's original sin. Okay, the old, let's, let's call it the sin nature instead of old sin nature. The sin nature is an integral part of every human being except for Jesus Christ. I was mentioning that, alluding to it in ways earlier. It is the center of man's rebellion toward God. Synonyms for the sin nature include, quote, old man, okay, palaios anthropos of Ephesians 4.22 in the King James Version. The Adamic nature, of flesh in the principle of sin of Romans 7 verses 8 through 20 and the death in Adam of 1 Corinthians 15 22 which we just saw a moment ago uh, it says the entire race was also condemned 1 Corinthians 5 20, 15 I'm sorry 1 Corinthians 15 22 a the sin nature resides in in the cell structure of the body and is the source of temptation, lust, and human good. Notice I didn't say sin. Temptation, lust, and human good. But man's volition, okay, so not the sin nature that resides in the cell structure of the body and being the source of temptation, lust, and human good, but man's volition is the source of sin. And the... See, think, God, the Holy Spirit versus the sin nature, pages one to four. So I pulled out all these books so that you could see them. This is God, the Holy Spirit versus the sin nature. And pages one through four, if I go there, uh, we have, we're dealing with the sin nature. And so it not only starts with that uh, heading on page one. But on page two, it shows some aspects of the sin nature, how there are personal sins on top and human good on the bottom. On the left, the uh, trend toward legalism, and on the right, the trend toward antinomianism. And above where it says personal sins, That is an area of, the area of strength. 
it's still not as good as divine good. So even though it is an area of strength, it's still part of the sin nature and not divine good and not, let's call it post-salvation divine good. So the trend toward legalism and the trend toward antinomianism are the lust patterns, whereas personal sins and human good are areas of weakness and areas of strength, all a part of the sin nature. Diagram on page two. On page three, we see, um, a, I'm sorry, I got to go this way. There we go. Uh, body of the church age believer, you have a soul on top, the sin nature and the human spirit and the Holy Spirit. Now the soul is that uh, position in Christ. The soul is there. And that's the top circle that we always have before our opening prayer. The bottom circle is where the human spirit is filled with the spirit. And so you can see there is a change there. Now, I read this book to everybody. Uh, we read it starting around exegesis number 130, which was all the way back in November of 20. So that was at 130. We're now at 265. And you can see that in 18, 19, and 20, I was first 100, 150 if you want to close to that. Um, and now we've had another 150, I'm sorry, 130 sessions. So we're at 265. It all adds up perfectly. So as I see that we started around exegesis 130, around the 23rd of 20, I put that in there because I didn't actually log the beginning date. But on page four, I logged that we were starting exegesis number 131 on 1130 of 20. So I had to guess about lesson 130 that we started it the week before based on the number of pages. So in this book, we have the footnote explaining about the sin nature. And the footnote at the very bottom there, God, the Holy Spirit versus the sin nature, 2013 pages one through four. And there you have it. Am I messing around? Yes. Am I serious? Yes. So I am messing around seriously or seriously messing around. All right, continuing in Operation Fig Leaves, let's, let's go again through these first couple sentences. Adam and his wife had been created without the knowledge of sin. Before the fall, they were ignorant of evil. Each possessed a human spirit for the fellowship with God, or for fellowship with God, and neither had a sin nature. We just saw the footnote on that. As long as they remained obedient to God's one mandate, they enjoyed the blessings God poured forth. However, the instant they partook of the forbidden fruit, they suffered spiritual death. They were tripartite, body, soul, and human spirit. When they partook of the fruit, the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, poof, they were now, uh, instead of tripartite, they were uh, uh, dichotomous. Another way to say it is they were trichotomous, and by losing the filling of the Holy Spirit, uh, they lost the spiritual component, and all they had was body and soul. And so they were, uh, instead of trichotomous, they were dichotomous, and they died. That part died. But the die is D-I, not D-I-E. And it's where we get dice, because there are two of them. All right. So we continue, um, as long as they re remained obedient to God's one and the blessing took of the forbidden fruit, 
They suffered spiritual death. They were stripped of their relationship with God. They lost their human spirit, as I just mentioned, acquired a sin, excuse me, sin nature, ugh, became aware of the existence of another plan, satanic good and evil. Now, notice that's not human good. And of course, there's no human, I'm sorry, there, uh, divine good. There's no divine good in it, and there's no such thing as divine evil. There's only divine good. But there's human good and evil. And here we go, Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They had never noticed their naked state in the pristine garden. Now the eyes of both of them were opened, in quotes, uh, to their nakedness. Looking at each other, Adam and the woman were ashamed. They saw themselves and were suddenly conscious of sin. Discovering their condition signified they had acquired a conscience. They could distinguish between good and evil, and their conscience was a witness to them that they were in a fallen state. Satan wasted no time in drawing their attention away from their fallen condition and onto their vulnerable nakedness. The ruler of the world naturally insinuated that clothing was necessary for Adam and the woman to make themselves right with God. Adam and the woman they attempted to solve the problem of sin and the sin nature with a superficial covering of fig leaves. In their estimation, this eye-opening situation of good and evil called for a relational adjustment. Adam and the woman covered themselves in an attempt to adapt to each other and to make a human adjustment to the justice of God. Well, now we have a footnote that says, for more on man's adjustment to the justice of God... See theme, The Integrity of God, pages 28 to 33, 95 through 97, 276 through 278. Now, again, all these books are available. This, I have three copies here. They're all different. Uh, as you can see, they may look a little different as far as the way they're printed and their fixes and this is the, let me see which one is the latest one i think it's this one yep this one the latest one is the one that if you go for example to page 28 through 33 you have the explanation here starting with the thinking of a judge and it uses Romans 117a for preposition gar. Therein is the righteousness, the kaiosune, of God. So of, well, instead of theos, it is with of God. So it's in a genitive form, theu, revealed. So the English, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. By the way, that would be the, uh, well, the verb uh, of apocalypto, where we get apocalypse, revelation. And so you'll notice here, uh, for example, there's a footnote from a quote dealing with the woman is beautiful. She's a beauty. And he says, unfortunately, hell, speaking of Helen of Troy, was all married to the king of Sparta, enter Trojan War. In the words of Aeschylus, or Aeschylus, however you want to pronounce it, What hast thou done, O Helen, blind of brain? O face that slew the souls of Ilion's plan. One face, one face, and many a thousand slain. And uh, see, these books are quite interesting. There is some background with uh, 
the the Greek tragedy and uh, very interesting Paris and that you'd think of uh, Paris France but where did the name come from and down here the footnote from Aeschylus or Aeschylus anyway the integrity of God and through page all these different pages 28 to 33 95 to 97 276 to 278 uh, this is a bunch of important and good stuff. Like I said, the reason whenever you see that I have more than one copy, it's because I have an older one and then they come out with a next edition and then they come out with a next edition and, you know, I have to have all the editions and I have to make sure that I know anything that has changed or been improved or edited or whatever. Why? Because two reasons. One is I need to know what does the improve do? If I'm going to cover it with you and you're going to get it, I want to make sure that you have the latest version. And if I cite a page number, it shouldn't be from one of the old versions. So all of that to say, yes, it gets complicated, doesn't it? And we must have everything in order the best we can. All right. So continuing uh, from our footnote 18, where I just left off on page 30. Behind these self-righteous efforts, well, let me start at the sentence before we got to our footnote. Um, in their estimation, this is uh, Adam and the woman, this eye-opening situation of good and evil called for a relational adjustment. Adam and the woman covered themselves in an attempt to adapt to each other and make a human adjustment to the justice of God. And that took us to... The integrity of God. Behind the efforts to make themselves acceptable to God was the thinking of evil. If we are right with each other, they reason, we must be right with God. If we put on some clothes and adjust to one another's shame and sin, we will be adjusted to God's justice. Thus began Operation Fig Leaves, the first act of human good, man's attempt to gain or regain in this case the favor of God through his own works. Human good is any benevolent production or deed that seeks to meet the standards of God apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the function of the sin nature, human good at its best, produces relative, temporary fixes to mankind. Problems and potence of God. No matter how admirable the accomplishments, no matter how sincere the intentions, human good has no spiritual or eternal value and is not rewardable in heaven. It obscures the grace of God and the reality of man's depraved condition. It always falls short of the standard of divine righteousness and for this reason falls right in line with Satan's agenda. Ugh. Boy, are we in the middle of that now or what? It is so bad lately. It's pathetic. I mean, it's always bad, but this is pathetic, what we're going through lately. Human good is a part of Satan's policy of evil, Satan's thinking, and reflects the subtlety of his genius. Theologian Lewis Berry Chafer points out that the system which Satan initiated in his fall includes, quote, quote, includes all the good which he can incorporate into it and be consistent in the thing he aims to accomplish. Here we go. Footnote 19, uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, Volume 2, and it's called Anthropology, I'm sorry, Angelology, Anthropology, and Homardiology, page 100. Now, this is that very book. Here you will barely be able to see if I hold it upright. Chafer, the top. Angelology, Anthropology, and Homardiology. And it is volume two, if you can see that two in there, from Dallas Theological Seminary. And if we go to page 100, and these have not changed uh, in their reprintings. By the way, Nine, chapter 9, 
Satanology, Satan's method. And if you go to page 100, this is where we have a quote saying, um, let me see, let me make sure I got this right. Cosmos Diabolicus. Let me see if I can find that. There it is. Um, oh, hold on. Includes. Where do I get the part that says includes? All the good which he can incorporate. I want to see where it says that. I'm not sure how it's quoted here. Ah, okay, so at the bottom, we are at page 100, and near the bottom, it says, that is, the system which Satan constructed includes all the good which he can incorporate into it and be consistent in the thing he aims to accomplish. Notice that. includes and quotes uh, all he can accomplish and then we get the footnote and page 100 and so uh let's keep reading uh there is then a conflict of good versus good that is satanic good Versus divine, divine good is service or deeds produced by the believer who is in fellowship. In other words, filled with the Holy Spirit. Divine good has spiritual and eternal value and is rewardable in heaven. Good to see the footnote here, footnote 20. And then we're also going to see footnote 21 here in a moment when we get to that there's 20. Satan seeks to replace divine good in this world by sponsoring the counterfeit righteousness of human good, like Operation Fig Leaves. Here's the fundamental flaw in Satan's cosmos, the cosmos diabolicus, which we see here listed at page 100. It mentions it several times on this page. Here's One of them right there, Cosmos Diabolicus, and I think it is up here. Yeah, there we go. That the Cosmos Diabolicus is to continue. Uh, he uses that term. It's an important term in this angelic conflict. And so, let's see, where am I? Boop, 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 boop. Okay, so... Um, Here is a fundamental flaw in Satan's cosmos. Human beings seek to adjust to each other instead of adjusting to the truth of God's person and will. That is pretty important and it's pretty messed up. Uh, they seek human solutions rather than divine solutions. Such No wonder no one is watching this broadcast. Many people assume they will go to heaven because they do not harm anyone or because they pay their debts or because they get along well with people or because they are respected by their peers. In other words, because they are, quote, good people. These beliefs exemplify the myth of salvation by works, uh, striving to please God through human efforts. Relative human righteousness is a vain effort that cannot meet the standard of God's perfect righteousness and justice. No matter how good man may be, he cannot on his own solve the problem of spiritual death, which is condemnation and separation from God. Man makes a permanent adjustment to the justice of God through faith alone in Christ alone. Footnote 21. This salvation adjustment to the justice of God results in justification from God. God gives you this justification. You're justified. 
Uh, at the moment of self, uh, I'm sorry, at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, God's own righteousness is imputed or credited to every believer. Romans 4, 3, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He is justified, making him acceptable to God in time and eternity. All right, so that was footnote 21. And so I will continue. Let's, let's start again at the beginning of, the, of that sentence. Man makes a permanent adjustus, uh, adjustment to the justice of God through faith alone in Christ alone. That's footnote 21, comma. And then he makes continual adjustments throughout his life as he grows spiritually. Footnote 22. Now, this is a pretty long footnote, so I'm going to hold it up and read it. Here's footnote 22. Metabolizing doctrine is the process of learning, understanding, and believing biblical principles in order to grow spiritually. The word metabolism is derived from the classical Greek noun metabole, or metabole, accent there on the uh, eta, meaning metamorphosis, so transformation. Meta is to change, and then uh, the morphosis, uh, that has to do with the body, so the body is changing whatever that body is, like uh, metamorphosis of a butterfly from, you know, uh, whatever you call it. Okay, uh, when food is consumed, the human body metamorphizes it. It converts it into nourishment for physical growth. By analogy, when Bible doctrine spiritual food is eaten under the filling of the Holy Spirit, it is converted into nourishment for spiritual growth. Jeremiah 15, verse 16a. See theme reversionism, pages three through seven. And that is my reversionism book. Where did I pull that one? I thought I had it out. Reversionism. Oh, shoot. Come on, where's my reversionism text? Can I move it again? I thought I had it out. Find it. All right. If I can't find it quickly, we're going to skip it. There's Christian suffering. All right. Well, you have probably seen it before with me. I'm surprised I can't find it. Had it out here earlier. Sometimes they get buried under another book. Reversionism. Come on. How the heck did that one get out of sorts? It always frustrates me, so I keep looking because I'm like, no, it's got to be here. And it is. I may run into it in a moment. But since I don't see it now, and we got to keep moving because there's so much here. All right, I'll try to keep moving. It's like, oh, I'm stuck. But it's because I want to show you the book. It's got that funny picture of the, I just saw it earlier, of the Christian soldier holding up a, a guide on, a flag. And because he's dead already, because he was in reversionism, um, you just see this skeleton holding it up. And it would be the guide on of his, uh, what would you call it? Uh, um, like platoon or something. I can't believe that I'm looking over and over again and I don't see it. So I moved it. Oh, it's because I had already pulled it out. <laughs> I told you. 
And so it was over at the other table. And there it is, reversionism. And our note is what? Reversionism, pages three through seven. And let's see, this is the new one. And yeah, I have two of them, so I have to always have the latest one, so I have the right page. All right, starting at three. Here is, at the bottom, Grace Apparatus for Perception. And in our text, says, so by analogy, when Bible doctrine, spiritual food is eaten under the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's converted in nourishment for spiritual growth. And we're seeing as per pages three through seven, but starting here at grace apparatus for perception, it means that we can metabolize, we can perceive this doctrine, we can digest it. Whereas if you're not a believer, you can't. And it takes Operation Z that we have studied in the past. Operation Z and the stream of consciousness. And how a pastor teaches and the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit turns it into pneumatikos, uh, which is this human spirit instead of... And so it's dealing with pneumatika and pneumatikos instead of uh, when it's... Instead of the being filled with the spirit when you're not filled with the spirit then it's not pneumatikos and rather i can't think of the right word um it, there's a so to it but being spiritual it's automatically transferred by the holy spirit to the soul where is that other word there's uh pneumatika and um Shoot, I can't think of the other word. I know it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But anyway, um, this is the uh, stream of consciousness. And in Operation Z, we're able to comprehend spiritual phenomena. So that's plural. Plural. Uh, there's the pneumaticas. Where is the other word that is when it's not spirit filled that's pneuma pneumaticas pneumatica and i can't think of the other word so they're really close by the way i think they're both p words but excuse me for that because I have perfect recall photographic memory and all that good stuff of course i don't know how some people have that if they really do that's pretty amazing isn't it uh, what is it? Uh, one of them is pneumaticas, and the other one is uh, I can't I can't get to the right part of my brain to pull it out. So I'll give up on that. But I did find the book. <laughs> so we did need that book. Uh, the what is it called? Reversionism. All right. So, uh, I still have to get to passing the buck. So, we're almost done. Let me keep reading. From footnote 22. Adapting to other members of the human race, uh, though important for human relationships, does not impress God. Living a good life can take God. Surprisingly, after the first man and woman succumbed to Satan's temptations, the deceptions of human good instantly controlled their lives. Adopting the devil's policy, they completely violated uh, the justice and righteousness of God and sought his approbation through a pitiful act of con covering themselves. Uh, there was no turning to God in recognition of their helplessness. They did not say, oh God, we have sinned. They did not implore his grace and mercy. Instead, they assumed that if they could become acceptable to each other, they would be acceptable to God. They assumed they had solved the problem because they had covered their nakedness. But who made the clothes? They made them. They sewed the fig leaves. They put them on. Adam and the woman expected their own works would square them with God, but they could no longer approach God. An impenetrable... 
barrier had been right between the first the moment they sinned and died spiritually. The fig leaves were useless. This reality hit them head on the moment the Lord entered the garden. Here we go. Genesis 3 verses 8 and 9. And when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool, meaning the spiritual time of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? That's Genesis 3, 8 and 9. The Lord God came into the garden to pay his daily visit to them in the spiritual time of the day the time of their daily exposure to God's word. Uh, what they do when they were among the trees, they recognized the inadequacy of the fig leaves. When God called to the man, the responsible one, the leader, to account for himself, why did Adam not respond to God as he had always done before? Uh, I should say, uh, had always done before he ate of the forbidden tree. He no longer ran to meet his creator because he had forfeited his personal relationship through spiritual death. Ugh. All rapport was gone between mankind and God. At that moment, Adam and the woman realized their total separation from God and their helplessness to do anything about it. All they could do was hide. They could no longer come face to face with God. They could not adjust to the righteousness of God, and this is why the justice of God had to judge them. In love, God will provide the justice of so he does provide. The only possible way spiritually dead Adam and the woman could regain their relationship with God was if someone else, totally acceptable to God, paid the penalty for their sin. See, this gets back to what I was saying earlier, uh, what I was saying in the earliest part of our uh, get-together tonight, that there was going to be somebody else, like I say before we have a silent prayer, who could pay for the sins, yours, mine, uh, everybody's past, present, and future. And so someone else uh, had to be totally acceptable to pay for their sin. Christ would be that someone else. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Although mankind did not become like God, as Satan claimed, in God nation, so that by means of, of salvation, mankind could share God's estate forever. And here, estate has to do with the idea of being in the same status. All these words with S-T-A-T, -T, stat, status, estate, they all kind of go together. And it's to say we would be in that condition, in that setup, that estate. There can be no greater love and no greater justice and righteousness. They go together. If Adam and the woman would accept Christ's still future work on their behalf, their human spirit would be restored to them. However, the sin nature was here to stay. So that's where we close tonight and where we will continue with passing the buck. And I guess uh, in commemoration to Adam and the woman, I showed you two bucks and I had this on the front of my phone that was a doe that was in the backyard one time doe a deer a female deer today I had and I think this picture no this one doesn't show both of them it's this one let me see if I can get to it oh come on no, it's not that one, is it? Yes, it is. Trying to get to... No, it's not. Ah, here's the one I wanted to get to. This is on my phone now. But there they are. Two bucks. So, passing the bucks. 
is, there's the other. How about that? Now, do you think God has a sense of humor that he put two bucks in my yard? Pass the bucks. Adam and the woman. I'll say that's pretty funny. <laughs> Even have the weird. All right. Anyway, I hope you like that. And what I'm going to do now is what I always do when we come to this point. Uh, I was hoping that I could do maybe a couple of more things, but I think we've gone pretty far tonight and covered pretty much everything I needed to cover, which is fantastic. Thank you, Lord. Um, why don't we pull up my prayer board and continue to be reminded that when you want to pray, you have to be in fellowship. Like we've been talking about tonight. It's what happened or not once they sinned. And when we sin, the first thing we can do for prayer of the four parts is rebound. First John 1, 9, if necessary. Then we give thanks to God. Then we intercede. And then finally, we can petition for anything that we might need to ask. And this is what I have to say about it. I would say that uh, in regards to petition, anyone can get a hold of me either uh, email or snail mail if you have a prayer request. And also in the chat room, anybody can make a comment. And uh, if you're willing to request prayer, go for it. But if you can in touch by email or snail mail, or if you have my phone number, you can leave a message if I don't answer, because uh, a lot of times, like right now, my phone is off. I mean, it's on, but it's in silent mode. It's supposed to be. We did get a beep at the very beginning there from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Murray. So, um, like I say, please uh, remember me in your prayers. I have always too much on my plate. So however much I can accomplish, I do. And the rest is always waiting for me to do later and to continue. How about you? Uh, if you have any other thoughts or questions, get a hold of me. If not, uh, I hopefully will see you on Wednesday night when we will continue in our other text. New Testament fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. And it's pretty awesome. And uh, this week, we are going to be dealing with part two, I think. And I think we're going to be finishing. Uh, he is our shepherd. So, in fact, I know we are going to be finishing it because we did the first part last Wednesday what I should say is I think we can get through the rest of it uh, on Wednesday. And then the next topic, a week from Wednesday, so nine days from today, will be his authority. How about that for something important? We're going to see all about his authority. So there you have it. And uh, I guess since I don't see that anybody's on right now, I'm just going to get so uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together and these very important thoughts, these subjects uh, that we cover and how they tie together and show us both the importance of your greatness and your, your essence, your sovereignty your righteousness, your justice, and your love. And all of that goes together along with the other six parts of your essence and including like the three O's, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence and things like uh, your veracity and immutability and whatever other one I left out. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, did I say uh, immutability? Anyway... 10 
Parents are remarkable and infinitely perfect in every way. Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And thank you that you have given us the opportunity to know about all this and to get to know it and to get to know you and to spend the rest of our lives together and eventually die and only die the first death and not have to die the second death, which would be a separation from you forever and ever and ever. Instead, we will die the dumb death uh, in this one-time situation in our bodies, uh, save the rapture. And eventually, uh, after that moment, we will be with you forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so I close with that in thanking you uh, for our, sal our so great salvation. And we all ask all these things. Shem Yeshua Mashiach, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and Savior and God and King. Thank you for all these things in his name. Amen. And so voila, I see somebody has chimed in at the end. <laughs> and uh, sometime during closing prayer, maybe. So uh, if you're there, or I guess you are, hey, hey. And uh, please uh, check out the replay. We've been on for an hour and 41 minutes plus. And it was the extension continues with the fall of man starting at page 27. And we got all the way to page 33. That's pretty amazing. That was a lot. And I like it that we ended on. Passing the buck. Big, some pretty play on words there. Passing the buck. So please catch the replay. <laughs> And uh, I bid you a good night and thank you uh, for anybody who sees this in perpetuity, a replay. Uh, thanks for having hung in there and stuck with it all the way to this point, to the end of the night. And so hopefully see you Wednesday night, same time, same station, either on Twitter at uh, PW for Theo down there or uh, on YouTube. And YouTube, I forget my exact name. It's something like at Philippe Willems 427, I think is what it is. So, and you got to spell my name right. It says Philippe Willems, one L, two P's, and then Willems with two L's. And ends like systems. So there you have it. Have a good evening and thanks again. See you on the next one. Good night.